Good morning. All right, I didn't realize that we got started. So good morning, everyone. Um, um, I'm just gonna give it a couple of minutes here for so for some more people to join us and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Alrighty. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. I am Sienna Marcellin, Special Events Associate here at SUM. Um, we are so glad that you can join us for another community conversation this morning. Um, we have a really fun one and I'm super, super excited. So we'll be talking about some Center of Employment Training. Um, and we have a fabulous panel yet again. Um, and um, just so, to give a little hint, um, we commonly refer to CET, oh, to Center of Employment Training as CET. So um, we'll be referring to it as CET throughout the duration of the, um, of the webinar. So you know what we are talking about. Um, as always, we have a fabulous panel of, um, of speakers joining us this morning. But before I introduce them, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping and Zoom instructions. I know we're probably all used to it by now, but I know for me, it always helps. So please note that we will be recording this presentation um, and we have intentionally set aside plenty of time for questions as we hear from our presenters. Um, if you would like to ask a question to any of our speakers, please feel free to utilize the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen with the Q&A icon. We also encourage you to use the chat box, which can be found at the bottom of the screen. Um, and please feel free to share what brought you um, here with us this morning or what you hope to learn or if you just want to chat, we're, we're here and we're watching. So um, let's get to the fun part. So joining us this morning, uh, we have Dirk Keaton, CET's Data Curriculum Manager. As always, we have our fearless leader, Ralph, Bo Ralph Boyd, our president and CEO. And um, our special guest today is Chris Christopher Moore. He's a recent CET graduate, and I'm super excited to hear from him. I got the opportunity to speak with him briefly um, a week, about a week ago, and nothing but great things to hear from him. So I'm super, super, super excited. Um, just before we get started, I just want to give a little bit of context on the importance of employment training. Like we, I think many of us take for granted careers and work and um, we don't often think about hard, how hard it is for some some other people to to find work and um, and how educa education and um, background can really play a part in people being able to to work and, and gainful and in, in uh, rewarding work I mean we've all probably had those jobs where we sit and we're like I have to go to work again like so CET is so amazing to me because it, they help people build careers. And I think that's so important. It's not just a job. They're, they're building careers. They're building someone, helping someone build a life for themselves. So before I go off on my tangent about <laughs> my thoughts on CET, I'm going to kick it right over to Ralph. Um, and just let's go with the question of the hour. How and when did job training become an inter integral part of some? What is CET? So uh, thank you for that question, Sianna, and good morning, everyone. Um, Sianna, I'm going to try to match your energy uh, and enthusiasm here, and I hope the substance of what we talk about and have, uh, have to say this morning, and in fact, justifies your energy and enthusiasm, and I think it will. 
So let me start out by adding the why, if I can, to your question of the how and when some added employment training to our full spectrum of services uh, for people and families. Our work, of course, is intended at its core uh, to transform people's lives and empower people and families, moving them from positions, as I like to say, of need and insufficiency to a position and a place of self-sufficiency, and then for many, even a measure of prosperity, both material, emotional, and spiritual. So many of us just don't aspire to being self-sufficient. We aspire to prosperity and all of its dimensions. And certainly the people we serve, our goal is to get them uh, on the path to that kind of sustainable prosperity. Um, there are uh, several of what I describe as points of leverage or inflection points or linchpins perhaps, um, but there are several critical elements, part of that process of restoring and helping people improve their lives. There are many, but I think we'd all agree that the most critical one certainly would include first housing. Um, and some certainly does that with our extensive uh, affordable housing portfolio with a full spectrum of supportive services. And we know from experience, we know from the data, we know from what common sense tells us that it is very difficult to help people both receive services that will help them and their families. And it's certainly difficult to have children prosper and be, become educated and academic achievers uh, when people are not stably housed, when they're either uh, experiencing homeless or at risk of experiencing homeless, so homelessness. So to get the services and programming to people to help this uh, life improving, life, life, transform, life transforming process that we talk about, uh, getting people sta stably housed is a critical element of that and certainly a big part of the sum spectrum of, of, of services. Physical and mental health. Heck, it's hard to do well if you don't feel well physically or, or emotionally. And some certainly uh, ministers to those needs, if you will, through our various clinics, our medical, our dental, our mental health clinics, and our addiction treatment programs. There is the issue of access to healthy food uh, related to, to the health issue. And some does that through our dining center, through our various food pantries and our food distribution network. There is the element of education. I think all of us know that education is really, if you will, the progress amplifier. That's how many of us have, have moved our station in life uh, through that platform. And some does that, and that is integrally connected to our, our, our CET program in ways that I think are unique, compelling, and powerful. And then finally, there is the employment trainment, training piece. It's the way that people ultimately can uh, secure and maintain and advance themselves in jobs that are, and you refer to this, um, uh, Siana, not just as jobs, but as careers, as career paths, jobs that can lead uh, people to a living wage that will sustain families, not just in the moment, but over time, and I would argue even intergenerationally. Mm -hmm. So developing the skills uh, necessary for a career and finding long-term employment with living wages um, that's often a barrier to achieving the independence and the personal advancement that our clients need and want, and heck, that we want uh, for ourselves and for them. So in 1998, some started our Center for Employment Training, CET, um, in addition to all those other critical programs and services that I mentioned. Job training and placement are critically important to fulfilling our mission of providing hope and opportunity for people. And the hope and reality of what I describe as uh, life uh, of earning, being able to earn a lifetime limit living wage with the possibility, heck, the probability of advancement and promotion. The COVID-19 um, pandemic, I think, underscored the, the need for this in a really kind of luminescent way, especially with respect uh, to the situations low wage earners so often uh, found themselves in and find themselves in being especially susceptible and vulnerable to what I describe as the volatility and the vagaries of the marketplace in the moment. 
So both during the pandemic and now as we emerge from it, our CET program is really a vital part of our mission. It's as vital as it's ever been. And that's also why job, job training as well as our other essential services remained, and I wanna underscore this, remained uh, operational over the entirety of the last 14 months, thanks to the investments that the broader sum community has made in us so that we can have the talent and the financial resources uh, and the physical assets to be able to adapt what we do and modify and adjust ourselves and how we do things and how we continue to deliver our programs meaningfully and robustly during a, a pandemic, or perhaps I should say, especially during a, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my answer. It wasn't brief and I'm sorry, but I, I, I think that puts in context the why of the how and the when. I love that. <laughs> Uh, we got the broad overview, so now now we can work down from there. Um, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, just to to highlight what you're saying, education is so important. You know, they say all the time, education is the, the great equalizer. And when we think about the overwhelming need for some services in the district, we have to wonder why the issue is so great. You know, and I I know Dirk will get into this later on, but you know, he taught me last week, and I was so surprised when he gave me this that you know, 70% of DC residents are under a sixth grade reading level. So what, do, what does that mean when we're moving forward? It even makes me think about health literacy and some of our other programs. So with that, I mean, how does job training function within the bigger sum setting? Um, when, when we talk about the other services that some provides, where, where does it fit in? And, and what's the impact that comes from that? So it's part of our continuum of care, the full spectrum of treating the entire individual that we talk about all the time. Um, and again, that continuum of care, that spectrum of services and programs are intended to allow people to achieve long-term stability and success for themselves and their families. And we know that you change one life, it has radiating consequences for the people who are close to that, that person. Uh, that means family and community, but it also has vertical consequences. And by vertical consequences, I mean, I, I, I mean generational consequences. You change one generation, uh, you're affecting all those that come after. But I would say this, there are multiple entry points for some services. And that's one thing we always try to underscore. There are lots of doors of entry to, so, uh, to some. And regardless of which door someone may walk through, our clients can access all those different programs of services. But a few facts to I, I'd elaborate, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure Dirk, who is our analytics guru, if you will, uh, can more than elaborate on this. But here's a few, a few facts for people. So 10% of our job training students come from SUMS transitional housing program. So you see the connection there. Somebody comes in through the housing door um, and then they're availed of all these other services and CET is right there. CET students are often referred to, uh, through, to both through and to SUMS medical and dental clinic as well as our uh, behavioral health specialists. So that's another connective tissue door, if you will. And then over the course uh, of the last 14 months, many of our residents face furloughs, layoffs, reduced wages. Some, uh, some CET program is a tuition-free option for people to learn new skills and employ, uh, uh, explore new career options. So SUMS door for job training, much like our other services, I want to underscore, remained fully operational during the pandemic. We transitioned to online classes quickly, I would say amazingly, with help from our donors that allowed us to secure the technology for our students, along with the know-how to be able to effectively use that technology to access our programming virtually, and also to have actual physical access to the internet. All of these were uh, key components uh, of making online learning a reality for our CET students in the middle of a pandemic. So kudos to our talent, but our talent and our physical assets and resources that our, the SUM community um, provides for us um, made that happen.
eventually students were able to regain access to our facilities in the Conway Center to continue the part of their program that's hands-on learning. And they continued to progress through that CET curriculum, receive their certifications. And like I think Christopher Moore is gonna tell us about who you'll hear from, um, they continue to be able to complete the program, get their certification, secure jobs, and, and frankly, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. S uh, secure a living wage job with a trajectory for promotion and progress that leads to a career, that leads to supporting a family, that leads to elevating that family in excellence. So that's that's my answer. Thank you very much. That was great. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why some and CET are so amazing because it's clear that the problem has been recognized and every day we're trying to provide the resources, the education and everything that people need to get to be uplifted. And I think that's super, super, super important because it's not just a temporary fix. We're setting people up for generations of success to come. And that is so amazing. And we see it all the time at CET. Um, Dirt, we heard a little bit about, oh, well, not a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you never hear a little bit from Ralph. <laughs> we heard um, some from Ralph about why job training is so important to some as a whole. But um, can you tell us about what CET is from the internal perspective? And um, what the last year of instruction kind of looked like um, in the virtual setting and hands-on. And I don't know if you want to throw it in there, but I'm super, super curious to just hear about you and your experience at CET and why you are so passionate about the work that you do. Oh. Uh, fit, fit that all in, but please <laughs> take whatever you want from that. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I'd love to. And um, I'll try to, I think, both reflect. I know Ralph actually gave so much of this content, so I'm going to definitely be reflecting some of what Ralph said. But at our heart, we're a job training program, and we offer four trades. Medical assistant. So when you go into a doctor's office, the medical assistant are going to be the individuals who take your vitals, draw your blood, do things like that. Medical administrative assistant, which I like to think of as the business side of the medical uh, workforce. They are the individuals who take patient records and do insurance, things like that. We also offer building maintenance, um, which uh, Mr. Moore was in, and the, that is individuals who do basic carpentry, plumbing, HVAC, and electrical work um, in um, office buildings and also in apartment buildings. And then we also have a specialized HVAC course, um, which focuses particularly on the heating and cooling uh, industries and trades. And each of these programs are six to nine months long. And um, as Ralph mentioned, they end in a nationally recognized certification. I think the other thing that's very notable is these are all what we've now come to think of as essential jobs. These were jobs that stayed open throughout the course of the pandemic and have retained employees and have continued to hire even as other sectors in the economy have kind of contracted. Um, and as Ralph mentioned, we're able to offer all of these services tuition free, and that's both because we receive private foundation grants and government grants, but I would say even more importantly is the funding of the donors who are joining us today, because that makes up the majority of our service, the majority of the scholarship that uh, covers our students' tuition. Um, one thing about our training program also is that includes an externship, which is very similar to an internship with our employer partners. And those partners include SUM's own property management and clinic, as well as um, a lot of other individuals like Bazudo or Police and Fire Clinic, and 75% of all instruction is either hands-on or practical. And so that means that students don't just learn the theory behind, behind their trade, but they actually get to learn a lot of the skills that are involved in the trade itself, so they're really prepared. Now, as you can see in this slide, we follow this unique model, um, which is called integrated education and training. And the philosophy behind this is that it's not enough just to help people build their skills, to help them learn how to draw blood or do um, tiling and cutting wood, but they also need to have basic education skills, um, which are things like math and reading. 
Uh, we also offer instruction in career development. So that is being able to interview, network, write a resume, write a cover letter. And we have human development, um, which by human development, those are supportive services or also what, what many people call soft skills, being able to set priorities, being able to resolve conflicts and set goals. And so each week, for our we offer 30 hours of instruction per week. And during each week, students get explicit instruction in all of this. And all instruction is contextualized to students target industry. So when students are learning area, it's not just like they're learning area in an abstract sense. They're actually uh, reading a blueprint and figuring out how many square feet of tile they need to bring into a building. And in, um, in the medical administrative assistant class, for example, um, our students learn percentages by calculating patients' insurance payments. So everything is real and put in its industry context. Now, to answer the other part of your question, in 2020, we offered over 35,000 hours of e-learning, and we offered that, as Ralph said, very quickly. We had all four aspects of this going within one month of the mayor's order to close in-person schooling. And over 24,000 hours were instructor-led, and that means that rather than students passively sitting on software, they were taking part in video lectures led by our instructors, and they were working with things like simulated blueprints, rulers, and gauges, so they could begin to learn some of those industry skills in the comfort of their own home. And because as we know, not everything can be learned online. You know, it's very hard to learn how to saw wood or lay tile in your own apartment. And so we offered 2000 hours of in-building instruction with social distancing. And this year we've managed to expand it even greater. We are on pace to really surpass it. We've offered 26,000 hours of e-learning, 21,000 of which were instructor-led, so over 80%. And an estimated one-third of all hours this year were in building, so about 8,000 or so hours. We also moved a lot of the support services online uh, by conducting over 1,500 wellness checks with our students uh, by a phone and video conference so that we can make sure that everybody's in a good place emotionally and that they have the supports in place to be able to move forward. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. And just going back to you talking about applying the, the education to what we're actually doing. I remember being in high school and being, when, when am I gonna use these formulas? <laughs> like, I don't know how to use these formulas. So I think really applying it to real life situations is, is an awesome way of teaching. That is amazing. Um, speaking of the virtual setting, Christopher, you are, you're in like that first, that first generation of virtual students. Um, you started your instruction with CET last year as one of our early virtual students and you graduated and you started your new career in December. Um, can you tell us about your experience at CET and, you know, can you maybe start with what motivated you to apply and really how you, how you got, how you got to where you are now? Yes, yes. Thank you. I'd love to share my experience. Let me pull it up. So, uh, good morning, everybody, members of the committee and all. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify at the budget oversight hearing for the community of a whole. I'm Christopher Moore, a SUM CET graduate and a Ward 7 registered voter. I'm speaking as a graduate of an OSSE adult and family education program, and I'm here to talk about the opportunities that CET gave me, which allowed me to advance in my life and begin my career as a building maintenance service technician. The opportunities that CET provided weren't available, weren't available to me at other institutions without paying exceedingly high prices. One school, for example, wanted to charge me sixty to $70,000. I couldn't afford to pay those prices to go to school. CT had the training that I was looking for and the skills I was trying to develop, like HVAC, electrical, plumbing, so on and so forth. So I capitalized on the opportunity. Some CT provided me with hands-on training that allowed me to get familiar with the tools, techniques used in HVAC and plumbing. I use these schools I use these skills, excuse me, every day as an employee of Equity Residential, 
before COVID, we learned the theory behind techniques that we use to perform, uh, to perform a specific job. After this, we would apply the theory. We would apply that theory. Apply that theory through 15 to 25 hours of shop work each week. After COVID, it was a difficult process to transition to learning online, but I was determined to graduate and I did everything I could to succeed. Our online classes were just like the theory classes, but via video conference. When the online classes started, all the people who were in class together locked on together and we built a sense of camaraderie. It gave me inspiration to keep doing what I was doing because I saw people who were in the same situation I was in. So in the summertime of 2020, when we were able to go back into the, uh, the building for a limited time because of social distancing uh, guidelines, only two to three people were allowed in the shop at, at a time. We had to wear masks and do daily symptoms and temperature checks, of course. Because of this, I felt safe going to class. We were able to do everything we learned through theory over the summer, like wiring switches, faucet installations and soldering copper pipes. So after completing all the shop work, uh, we were given practice exams that we could use to, uh, that we could use to study for our HVAC exam to get our certifications. And uh, we would do this for about a month, me and a couple other students who also got their certifications with me. And, uh, you know, after studying really hard for about a month, I would say uh, we finally passed. I was really nervous when I took the test, but, you know, through a lot of support, I was able to, uh, you know, get a nice score on the exam. And, uh, you know, after that, I, I began my job search. And soon, not too long after, I found, uh, you know, an opportunity of employment with Equity Residential as a service technician. So here I am today. Awesome. Oh my gosh. I always say we can, there's no experience like when that comes from someone who did it themselves. And I, that your story is absolutely amazing. I have like goosebumps and I'm like, I know I don't know you personally, but I'm so incredibly proud of you well, <laughs> and um, you. all thank your you. classmates. Um, that's, that's awesome. And it's, it's amazing to hear how you were you were still able to do that hands-on instruction still feeling like you're getting the instruction that you need and um to be able to find well to be able to have some provide those resources for you i mean you're, you're saying you know school is expensive school is expensive so um being able to to get the get that instruction and find those resources um from an organization that's that's there to do it and support you free of charges is absolutely phenomenal um Dirk um I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back to you um job training isn't a new idea and some is certainly not the only ones involved with this kind of programming how and why is some CET different than other job training programs oh absolutely I'd love to answer that question I think <laughs> ways it's my favorite question to answer but I think one thing that makes some CT really different from a lot of the other programs around is that we're very responsive to the needs of district residents and rather than trying to push people out we try to bring as many people in as we possibly can and make job training work for the city um, as you can see from the slide that was just put up, over 71% of all jobs in DC require post-secondary training. And that includes the kind of credentials that uh, Mr. Moore has earned. And there's a really great desire for training in the city. Um, the Workforce Board did a study of DC residents um, after the pandemic who'd recently been uh, unemployed. And they found that 22% of those residents reported they needed further training in order to re-enter the workforce. Um, however, most publicly available like free training programs in the district require a high school diploma and eighth grade level reading and math skills. And that's a big barrier for a lot of individuals. Um, one thing that is uh, people don't always realize because DC is the most credentialed city in the world, 
At the same time, we have 40,000 individuals who do not have a high school diploma in DC. And if we look at the next slide, um, over 22% of all DC residents are functionally illiterate. And so that means, of course, they won't be able to make that eighth grade reading level. But moreover, those same individuals, um, and I know functional literacy can be something of a complex concept, they might be able to recognize some words, write some words, um, sound out some words even, but making sense of a short paragraph or instructions or even a warning sign could be very difficult for them. Moreover, over 34% of all DC residents, including those with high school diplomas, are at the very lowest level of numeracy. And that means they might be able to add or subtract, but multiplication, division, and the kind of more complex math you need to do a career job are gonna be very difficult. And so, like I said, the strategy for the district has been rather to help people grow those skills while they're preparing for a career. It's been making people put in their own work, build those skills on their own, and then career training will be available to you. And some CTCs, there's a different method. And as you'll see on the next slide, we have a very unique um, approach. Um, all of our math instruction is co-taught by an industry instructor and a math instructor. And they incorporate real industry tasks and examples. To give a little more context, um, students, for example, learn how to um, add and subtract fractions by building and modifying piping systems. And they learn how to multiply decimals by using Ohm's law, which is a basic electrical formula. And we can see the results because 84% of all some CT students last year increased their reading and math skills by two grade levels or more in 2020. I should add as well that because we have this strong support, we're able to take in students who only have a third grade math level and a sixth grade reading level. Now, our students' average scores vary a lot, but by keeping it open to students with relatively low skills, what we can do is we can help people build up from where they're at. Moreover, we also don't require a high school diploma and we start new classes every two weeks. And so that means that when you're ready to start training, we're ready for you. And so all of those supports we do are built to try to break down barriers so that it's easy as possible for residents to enter the program. Um, and as you can see, we've had great results. Um, if you just look at our basic education scores alone, and mind you, this is a six month long program. Um, we, our students uh, have consistently surpassed the district um, in terms of the amount of educational gains they've earned. And each of those gains are at least two grade levels. Moreover, we've continued to grow year over year. Wow. Sienna, if I can just exercise a point of executive privilege here, which I'm gonna do whether you give me permission yes. or not. Um, I, I was going to turn it over to you anyway. So <laughs> no, I was just going to I just, no, you don't have to. I just was going to say this. I think what Dirk just covered is so profound and powerful. It's one thing to have a training program that works, that gets students the skills they need, and then provides entree to real jobs. So the data around how many of our folks who go through the curriculum, get great jobs, and then you look longitudinally and still have them and are advancing years later. That data is very powerful, but none of that matters if a third or a fourth grade reading level or math competency keeps you from even being able to enter the door of the program. So this kind of what I'll just describe as pre-education remediation piece is so powerful and, you know, Dirk has kind of glossed over, oh, yeah, here's all the stuff we do. I've been, I was in education for a while. That is very, very hard to do. So when we're talking about moving people multiple grade levels and reading, comp uh, reading uh, comprehension and math competency, and then connecting it to the particular skills they'll have to apply in the workforce is really compelling stuff. So um, I didn't covered it in a very clear way, but I guess I wanted to climb up in the pulpit and shout it out a little louder. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, 
adult education is is a different kind of is a different kind of beast. I mean, I just think I try to teach myself things all the time, and my brain is not like a sponge. And I <laughs> and so I um I can't I really imagine that it takes um quite a lot of of a passion, a passion and determination and a, a true desire to want to help people to really have this kind of successful adult education. Um, it's, it's truly uh, amazing. Um, Ralph, it's a good thing uh, that the CEO isn't tested on his ability to apply Ohm's law and any of the formulas connected with it. So I I'm just happy about that. Yeah, I just had a ninth grade flashback of Ohm's Law and it did not click <laughs> for me. So um, I definitely um, am with you on that one. But um, Ralph, what, what would you like to see um, at CET in the years ahead? Um, and how can those joining us here on the Zoom today, how can they help? So my answer to that initially at a high level, Sienna, you could predict, which is more and better, <laughs> more of it and do it even better for more and more people. So that's my aspiration for the future. And um, for people who are on this, this webcast, we're in the process of creating what I think is a, a dynamic, compelling, ambitious, aggressive, bodacious five-year strategic plan. And so more and better is at the core of all the elements of that plan. But we wanna figure out how to continue to create greater capacity to do what Dirk has described, to do more of it and to continue to improve it and refine it so that we have more Christopher Moores out there uh, uh, in, the, in the national capital region and in some instances, uh, hopefully beyond. So that's my aspiration. Before I say what folks can do, let me just really underscore the value of the talent we have that makes this the CET engine go. Uh, Dirk's a great example of that. He's an incredible resource for us. He's our analytics guru. He's a force amplifier. Uh, the person who leads our workforce development programming, Veronica Wright, is terrific. Our other CET staff are deeply committed to this work. And what's even more significant is this is an area of significant volunteer contribution and activity for us. Our volunteers teach stuff, they coach stuff in this space, and they are a powerful, uh, I'll get use that term again, force amplifier uh, for us in this space. So we, wanna, we want a more, more time, treasure, and talent from the broader some community to continue to help this, uh, this uh, CET engine grow and, and, and prosper. Um, more specifically, um, what people can do is, of course, financial resources are always a part of what we do. So the treasure part of the time, talent, and treasure um, um, phrasing is, is a critical part of it. There are volunteer opportunities in this space. As I said, we use volunteers in this space to coach, to mentor, uh, and to um, also do things like um, attend mock interviewing sessions. So the soft skills that, that Dirk talked about that is a part of our CET training. So when, when students uh, successfully complete, complete our program, they then have to go out and do something that we all have to do more or less to advance ourselves, which is market ourselves, to, to be able to reflect what we've learned and what that means in terms of what we're able to do and deliver to a prospective employer. So uh, we have volunteers that are part of that whole process from volunteer teaching, supporting, coaching, and also doing mock interview sessions so that our students hit the interviews um, well-armed and, and well-prepared. Um, we always can use more employer uh, partners out there, uh, employers in the building maintenance, construction, HVAC, and healthcare trades. The more partners we have, the more leverage that creates, the more opportunities for students uh, going through the CET program uh, successfully. So um, there are a multitude of ways folks can help us. Um, if they have any questions about how they can help us, you can always raise your hands and call us or email us and we'll, uh, we, will, we will respond. Thank you. Um, just going back to what you're saying about you know, the talent that's at CET. 
um, it's it's talent from our staff, it's talent from our students. It's it's amazing, and I'm just thinking to to be such great educators. You you're not only you don't only only have the talent and knowledge. You're, you're a motivator, and that's so important. <laughs> it's so important to be motivated. And when I think about my favorite teachers or the teachers that I feel have taught me the most, they're always the biggest motivators. And I know just talking to Dirk on a regular, like he's always so bubbly and, and happy and ready to share information. So it, it's so important to make sure that you're motivating and inspiring and keeping people into what they're doing. I mean, our students, they come in and they're determined. They are ready to go. Christopher, just telling your story, you were focused, you had a plan, you know, you knew what you wanted to do. So it's really amazing when you can put those two things together and really see the success that blooms from that. Um, so I'm Dirk and I have talked about this, Sienna, about when you ask me the aspirations for the future and I say more and better. So one of the ways we get better is to, is to look, uh, evaluate our program and to do a real evaluation, it needs to be longitudinal. So, you know, we can tell you right away how many students successfully go through our program, how many students get hot, what percentage of students get hired and what kind of time frame. But the real question about impact is taking those five and 10 year looks at folks and see what they're doing and how they've progressed and where they are. And that, and we're, you know, we continue to try to build out the methodologies and the analytics to do that because it's that kind of information that'll help us to, you know, construct a, a more and better mousetrap, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this time, I'm going to um, open the, the floor up to some questions. Um, again, just um, to remind you all, we have the question and answer box at the bottom right of the screen. Um, if you want to direct your questions, I do have already a question sitting here, um, and it's for Christopher. Um, do you um, do you have any reflections as a CET student and re recent um, graduate um, that you would like to offer to us? Um, it could be things that you loved, or maybe things that you would like to see in the future. What what can you tell us? What can you reflect upon your experience? Yes, actually, uh, there's a lot of different things that I would like to see uh, in the future, at least for improvement for students. You know, I myself am, am not a felon, but uh, you know, other guys who graduated have an issue. You know, they have a criminal record. And it's very difficult to get a job like that, you know, because mm -hmm. there is a lot of discrimination against people with criminal records. So to take time off from work, to go through this program and put all your effort into it, only to be denied because you have this history is it's kind of tough. So, you know, in the future, if possible, I would like to see something, you know, improve you know, at least in terms of opportunities for guys with criminal records and stuff like that. So that's one thing that I would like to see. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, that's very important. And I think, you know, when we talk about identifying, identifying the need um, for some of our services, there are so many things that many of us often forget. Like when we talk about education, we talk about literacy, we talk about, you know, past. And I think uh, oftentimes we, we forget you know, may, people may have criminal backgrounds. And I, I do think that's something um, to, that we, we definitely want to work on moving forward. And I'm sure um, Ralph, will, Ralph and, and team will figure out a way to try and um, work on that maybe with some of our hiring partners, but yeah. Yeah, that's a um, profound point. I'm, I'm happy that um, folks with criminal histories actually have access to our programming. That's not true for all employment training programs and especially ones that uh, have some uh, degree of, of subsidy. So I'm glad we have access. I think Chris's point is a really important one. It's one thing to provide access and give folks the tools, but we've got to figure out how to work um, both with folks who come out of the program as graduates and with uh, potential employers about how we um, get those, do those doors of opportunity open, um, understanding that employers have legitimate interests and concerns in the safety of their workplace and their, and their people, 
uh, but to um, provide probably a, a, a path that is legitimate and convincing to putative employers that the folks they're getting from us are not just um, qualified in terms of training and education, but are qualified as a matter of character as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my next question here is for Dirk. Um, I know Ralph um, talked about wanting to keep up and track graduates. Um, we have a question here that says, does some keep up with graduates after they finish the program? And do we have an alumni network? I'd love to answer both of those questions. Um, so first off, we do keep track of graduates. We have a really unique thing called retention services. And so after students um, enter employment in the field of their, uh, in the field they've been studying for and enter full-time employment, then they sign up for retention service, which is a which is a monthly program where they meet with our employment retention specialist and they get individualized counseling and support um, based on um, their situation. Very often, what we'll do is we'll not only form a relationship with that client, but we'll also form a relationship with their employer. And so, very often, we can get feedback from both the client and the employer. So, if there's a little um, thing on the job that maybe is affecting the employee's performance, we can be there and be that sort of a neutral third party who can help uh, help both the employer and the client, you know, succeed on the job. And we also, during that time, help our clients set goals, make them see what's next, whether it's uh, whether it's getting another certification or um, building out or building out a side business. Very often students in the maintenance field also do some independent work. And so very often they'll set goals like I wanna save money to buy a truck. And so we'll help them set those goals. And for participating in that program, students receive um, up to $650 in cash and in-kind incentives. And we do that first to keep people motivated. And also because we know that very often your first year on a career job can be your most expensive year. Um, just because you're having to solve a lot of problems with money that you weren't having to before. Um, in terms of an alumni network, we do have um, alumni events. We try to have one every quarter and we're looking on uh, picking them up. We sort of put them on pause during COVID, but that's definitely something we're going to be picking back up. And I think what's always special is I um, am he I've been here for um, since 2012 and I will still see people from my very first year at some come to our alumni event. I also, if it's possible, I'd love to uh, give a little information that's relevant to uh, the things Mr. Moore said. I think one thing that we're very aware of is about 26% of our students historically have been returning citizens. And um, a few years ago, I did a five-year study of our returning citizens, and it turned out they were the single most successful subgroup of our students. So our students who were returning from incarceration or were justice involved, so they'd had a criminal background, um, actually got employment at a higher rate than individuals who were not. And I think a lot of that happens because, um, because we the work happens very often on the side, um, where what we'll do is we'll have individualized conversations with students where we'll sit down, talk to them about their criminal record, talk to them about how to resolve those problems and how to message that in an interview. And um, we also help direct people towards things like background expungement, background sealing. I know a couple of times we've hosted the um, DC Office of the Public Defender um, who actually did a background sealing and expungement fair on our site. So I think it is it is one of those things where it is, it is a moving target. I think the challenges are um, very present for individuals who have a criminal record, but I think we're um, we're very um, responsive to that. And I know whenever we meet new employer partners, one of the first questions we always ask is, what's your stance on criminal backgrounds? Because we don't wanna set up a student where we send them off to a job that they then aren't able to progress. In. That is incredible. Man, it's great when the CEO joins the call and actually learns stuff. <laughs> My eyes are like I, <laughs> bugging out because that is so incredible. Um, Dirk, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, 
because I, as Christopher was saying, I can imagine how disheartening it must be to go through all that training, all that hard work, all that time and dedication, and then to not get the result that you wanted. So I think it's incredibly important that we provide those skills and even um, those um, opportunities and even thinking hiring partners, you know, asking, asking right away if, you know, we're looking at criminal history. And I, I think that's important um, as we move forward and start to bring on new hiring partners. Um, so that's the door we want to be, right? So when someone has um, been incarcerated or had adverse contacts with the, with the criminal justice system, and I was a, I think you know, Sienna, homicide prosecutor in a, in a prior life, but when folks get it together and are doing it the right way, the right things, we want to have doors to open for them. So um, um, for some, some, some people, it takes longer to get there. But when people are there, we want to have a level of receptivity that takes advantage of the moment, uh, uh, that, that transformational moment. So I think this is a really important conversation. Yeah, I have time for about two more questions. Um, one um, is directed, I think, at Dirk. Um, who are some of our employer partners? Oh, I think you're Dirk, you're muted. Yeah. I'm so sorry. That was bound to happen. But yeah, no, we actually have a, <laughs> um, we actually have a great list of employer partners I'd love to share. Um, and so I, I want to highlight these individuals because these partners are not only um, partners who specifically have um, employed our students, but a lot of these are also externship site hosts. So they also, all of our students, like we said, go on externship um, with our um, um, with our with our uh, with one of our employer partners or with some zone services. And we can see we have Bizzuto, we have Property Management Association, MedStar Washington Hospital Center, Unity Healthcare, who we also share the Conway Center with, and uh, we're actually doing some very unique partnerships with Unity Healthcare this year, where they're we're going to be sharing our training space, and they're going to be training some of their um, nurses and other and other frontline staff in our training space as well. Um, construction, who we're making an agreement with, where some of our students um, will actually be able to um, work on a some property uh, there. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, Children's Hospital, um, Police and Fire Clinic, who has been a I will say definitely a big um, externship partner in the past few months. Um, the uh, Kamara Newsom, Newsom Williams uh, Nurse Practitioner Group, uh, Family Solutions of Ohio, Ascension Psychological and Community Service, and Patricia Schultz DPM. And those are all very longstanding employer partners who have done a lot for our current students while they're on the externship and beyond after they get hired. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and then I'm going to kind of morph this last question for Christopher. Um, and it's, it's some of my a personal question of mine as well. Um, I know we have the motto, we say one CET, only CET. What does that mean to you? And um, if you can, I think they kind of tie in together. You know, how did how did you learn and find out about CET? How did you learn and find out about CET to become part of CET and continue to always be CET? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, when I first moved to DC, uh, I was in a very, uh, you know, difficult situation living wise with my family and everything that happened because I moved here from Jersey. And, um, you know, I didn't finish college or anything like that. I don't come from some prestigious family, you know, no generation of wealth or anything like that. I was like, hey, I have to develop a skill that can take me forward in life so that I can pro provide for not only myself, but the people that I care about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, based on you know everything about me, my personality and the kinds of things that I like, you know, I prefer hands-on things. So that's how I got into the building trades. And out of all of them, I back the most. So, you know, I did my own search and that's when I came across some CET because uh, where they had trade school that provided the training, but you guys were affordable and you guys met everything that I was looking for, you know, all the criteria and stuff like that. So that's how I discovered some CET. 
And, you know, because of you guys, which I'm really appreciative of, you know, I have a job today. And if I look back, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, a lot of things have changed. You know, some things that I'm not even aware of yet. It may take me some time to, uh, you know, notice, but I'm truly appreciative of everything that you guys have done for me and all the opp opportunities that you guys have uh, presented me. Thank you very much. Wow. Oh my gosh. I'm going to try not to cry. I'm very emotional. Babe. And thank you for taking, <laughs> Christopher, thank you for taking full advantage of them. It's one thing to have them be there. It's another thing to have uh, to have somebody avail themselves of it and have it work and then to preach about it. <laughs> so, which you do very well. So thank you. Thank yes, you. Very, thank you. So thank much. you. Um, well, we are coming to the end of the hour and uh, we are going to conclude. Um, but once again, I just want to say I'm so glad to have you all be a part of um, this morning's community conversation. Um, I think we, we learned, I learned uh, quite a bit and I think we covered some really important things. Um, I think education and training is something that's often overlooked. And I remember when I was first introduced to CET at my orientation, when I started at some, I was like, oh my gosh, this place does everything. <laughs> like, it is incredible. Um, but never did I imagine that I would see CET and learn that it's one of the most inspiring and impactful programs that I've ever seen. Um, when we think about the overwhelming need here, um, CET definitely, definitely has a very strong place in what we're doing to help the community that we serve. Um, I, I, I feel like I can't even find the words. I did not expect myself to, <laughs> to learn so much and feel so, um, and feel so inspired by this conversation today. So um, with that being said, um, I would like to thank our speakers. Dirk Keaton, um, you are awesome, an awesome data curriculum manager. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Um, Christopher, thank you for sharing your story, your testimony. It is absolutely amazing. And I wish absolutely nothing but the best for you moving forward. Um, and Ralph, as always, we love to hear what you have to share about some. <laughs> and just to echo some of Ralph's words, we are always looking for that support um, from our donors, whether it's financially on a volunteer basis, um, being a hiring partner, um, there are tons of ways to support some and some CET. Um, you can also find that on our website. And if you are looking for other ways, please, um, I have to um, shamelessly plug myself here. Our special events um, always support our services. Um, we have a few events coming up this year. So please be on the lookout for those. Um, and um, I guess I will give you back the rest of your Thursday. Um, and we hope that you will join us for our next community conversation. Um, sorry, I lost that date. Um, <laughs> give me just one moment. We'll be um, speaking with um, Family Services um, do, 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 on August 10th. Thank you, Stephen. And also I would like to thank um, the genius behind our community conversations in the background, Stephen Marcus, um, our individual philanthropy um, leader. So um, thank you all. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your Thursday and we'll see you on August 11th. <laughs> thank you, Sienna. Bye-bye. So much, it was great to talk with everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Be well, sir. You too, sir.